Our next speaker is Sue Cox, a co-founder of Survivors Voice Europe, a self-funding organization of survivors of Catholic clergy abuse and a critic of Vatican fundamentalism. Sue is also a 67-year-old grandmother with nine life-threatening or life-limiting conditions who has been in her time an alcoholic, addict, serious self-harmer with an eating disorder, a victim of clergy sexual abuse, and of rape. She suffered domestic violence and attempted murder and has been a single mother of six children. Please give a warm welcome to Sue. I bet you can't wait to hear what I've got to say after that introduction. It sounds really wonderful, doesn't it? Okay. Um, I asked Peter, when Peter asked what, how I'd like to be described, then I particularly asked him to describe me in that way. And is that not on? Yes, hold it okay, close. hold it close. Um, and, and that was really just to demonstrate something, and it's largely how we make assumptions about things. Uh, when you heard that description, you will have an image in your head and it probably looked a little bit like this. Um, clearly, it's perfectly true what Peter said about me, but there's a little more to it than that. What um, people see is not necessarily what they get. Uh, one of these occasions, uh, one of the charming gentlemen who, having heard this sort of stuff, uh, felt it his entire duty to keep me away from the bar for the entire time, um, and sympathizing with me that I was around all these drinkers. Uh, because what he didn't know is it's 38 years since I used a mood-altering chemical and I, um, I work in addiction. I head a large teaching organisation um, and we teach in the health service, the prison service, the military mental health. And I have personally taught 13,000 healthcare workers, including several consultant psychiatrists. So what you actually see is not what you get. No, that's not that. <laughs> The reason I'm saying that is because I can't prove categorically that all of those ills came from the fact that I was abused and raped by a Catholic priest. But what I can do is tell you the science that suggests that it's absolutely true. Um, the next thing that Peter said to me, what it said about me, was that I was a single mother of six children. All perfectly true. Not rocket science to know that as an ex-Catholic, I was liable to be uh, have a lot of kids. Um, so you've got an image in your head about the old woman who lived in the shoe, churning out babies and living on benefits. Um, but that's not actually how it was. Yes, it's true that I had six children. And I was left alone with them when I was 32, and they were all under 12. But I didn't ever receive benefits. I worked, and I worked very hard. And now my children are extremely successful, well-rounded professionals um, who are an asset to the community. So what you see is not what you get. One of the things that I clearly want to say ultimately when I'm talking to people about Catholic clergy abuse is not only that the effects of this goes deep into my life but actually can be passed through my DNA to the next generation and possibly the next. Uh, there is scientific research to suggest that this is true. So when we start looking at these kind of pictures of childhood sexual abuse, I imagine that's up there, you will already have a picture in your head once again. And I can't take that out of your head. Uh, once we talk about sexual abuse, you will have an image there. But if we constantly dwell on the physicality of sexual abuse by clergy, then we're really missing the point. Uh, what we need to concentrate on, I believe, is the environment in which it occurred. The Catholic environment actually makes childhood abuse almost inevitable. Um, so I can only speak about my ex experiences with the Catholic Church. Now, Survivors Voice Europe is a very different organization from most of the abuse victim organizations you'll come across, largely because we feel very definitely about not being victims and being survivors. Also, we're very much um, attuned to secularism, atheism and humanism and we run our organisation accordingly. Now most of the survivor organisations are still unfortunately linked albeit a small amount with the church. This is the way the church continues to manipulate uh, this particular subject. 
Um, the Catholic Church has been destroying people's lives for thousands of years and are still continuing to do it. And they do it in a very subtle way. Uh, they do it by infiltrating, by indoctrination, by all sorts of ways. Uh, twice this morning I've been approached by people who had been brought up Catholics and we all say exactly the same thing. Uh, that experience of abuse and indoctrination goes in deep, it goes in young and it stays a long, long time. It's very difficult to uh, shake off. Um, you know, the Catholic Church is, has got two faces, the one that the public sees and the ones that the rest of us see. Uh, so what you see is not what you get, uh, is my message at the moment. Um, what we've got really are a narcissistic organization which really doesn't consider anything other than its own face. Now, as you know, narcissists can be very charming, they can be charismatic, and they can suck you in, and they can hijack you. And this is how they operate. Now, that's a picture of the devil. <laughs> now, I don't believe in the devil any more than I believe in God, but nonetheless, when I first got into recovery from addiction, this was a very useful analogy that I was given. I was told that if you could imagine your life as a very beautiful ship with lots of potential, with everything it could possibly need for the voyage ahead, um, but suddenly, in addiction, um, it's been hijacked, and it's been hijacked by this devil. Um, and he rules with tyranny and cruelty, and you're very afraid of him, and you're in chains, and you're very disempowered. In recovery, after hard work, we manage to overthrow that demon, take back our ship, take back our power, and start to move in the way that we should have done in the first place. The devil, meanwhile, is relegated to scrubbing the decks, but he's still barking out instructions because he still thinks he's in charge. This is the way that we view the Catholic Church, despite the fact that they're being disempowered on a regular basis by activists like myself and my colleagues, they still are barking out instructions and they still consider that they're very much in charge. If we continue to listen to the voice of that deck scrubbing demon, then we are giving back more power. If we go to them and ask for help, then we're giving them power again. You do not feed a narcissist. What you do with a narcissist is turn away from them, and that way they're more liable to be disempowered. I've lost my notes, actually. I, sh I should have some notes here, but Jack was very kind to get my computer working, but I've now mucked it all up by losing my notes. So I'm sure I had something very prolific to say about that particular picture. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that hijacking is, the church does this exactly the same thing. It hijacks people. Um, and it's very similar to the kind of hijack situations that we've come across. Um, the OPEC, uh, Anteb, uh, all of these famous hijacking, especially the one in Stockholm where uh, the, the, p the people who were taken hostage, when they came out, um, not only empathized and sympathized with their captors, but were really promoting them and saying how wonderful they were. This is this what we now know as Stockholm Syndrome, uh, where uh, people who've been hijacked often will praise those hijackers because of this connection, this incredible uh, biased connection. Um, after three days, these people were already promoting them as being their saviors, despite the fact that they had ruined their entire lives. So um, we see this all the time with the church. What we now know about the way the brain is wired and how we need each other in order to survive this um, evolutionary perspective, this evolutionary um, imperative really to be part of a pack, to be part of a team, to be part of a village or whatever, is very much used against us. The church very cynically uses this against us in a way that we saw with the Stockholm um, survivors. So you see supplication as being the only way out. If you're hardwired to stay alive, then you're also hardwired to be on the side of that which is dangerous. So we see this with other species too. Very soon, we're back into that dance, that narcissistic dance with this demon, and he's back in charge again. Uh, we're back into this suppli supplication uh, situation. Now, I could go on about all the childhood effects of, char of sexual abuse. There are many and various. I'm not going to talk about those because um, if we s concentrate on those, we're, we're also missing the point. We need to look at the broader picture. 
This is why secularism is incredibly important to us as survivors. If we start giving back our power to the Catholic Church, no matter how small that power might be, then we're starting to feed that narcissist once again. So we feel very strongly that secularism is our way forward. Um, these days, we support many people throughout the world. So I, I could name all the countries, Canada, Australia, South America, Colombia, um, Burma, Poland, especially Italy, all of the European countries. Our remit largely is to connect with those survivors who for many years thought they were the only ones. Our other remit is to teach and educate people about the severity of childhood abuse. Uh, Peter also said that I've got nine life-threatening and life-limiting conditions. Perfectly true, probably because I'm quite old. But I can't prove categorically that those conditions and the shortening lifespan that I now have is a direct result of Catholic abuse, but the science tells me that that's true. So in our experience, we can educate people about the science of abuse. Now that will work regardless of who the tyrant is. Um, so my, inf <laughs> my final clip is really, when you see these wonderful pictures of a cuddly pope who's now the smiley face of the Catholic Church, please do not believe that picture because what you see is not what you get. Um, they simply <laughs> brought out a smiley-faced rat. They swapped a rat-faced snake for a smiley-faced one, but they're both equally slimy. Believe me, you're not going to see what you get. These days, we're very fortunate to be able to join with other secularists uh, because there's a common misconception that if you've got only one agenda, that you're not in interested in other people's. But I didn't get sober to sit and talk about drink, and I certainly didn't recover from Catholic childhood abuse to sit and talk about sex. What I got recovery for was to join shoulder to shoulder with other issues, with all of these issues that affect us, um, like we've been collaboratively involved with the United Nations un uh, Committee for the Rights of the Child and the Committee Against Torture, with Think Week, with Oxford University Press. So we got sober and we got clean and we got recovery in order to join our place in the world. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Sue.